especially when the speakers are uh, uh, have accumulated a lot of uh, experience in that area and at uh, 16 uh, at uh, 16 p.m. Armenian time uh, we're going to have a panel discussion which will be moderated by Heran Khachatyan and the panelists will be Levan Sinadze, who already spoke today earlier, uh, Vahan Petrosan, who is the CTO of uh, Super Annotate, and Mandali Avatisan, whom you also uh, uh, had the chance to hear a bit earlier. Uh, so uh, we'll be waiting for you at 16 p.m. And for now, we have a half an hour break. So see you at 16 p.m. Okay. So the first question I want to discuss is about the annotation process. So we know that all of the machine learning in computer vision requires a lot of annotations, which is sometimes expensive and hard to organize. And when I think about it, there are several ways to do the annotations. Who, who is doing the annotation? First question. Oh, I, I know at least five options. One could be experts, like in case of medical stuff. So there is no one else who can basically do the annotation. The second that I have in my mind is engineers, which is not very common, but I think it's sometimes very important so that engineers themselves do this to see how hard it is to do and what are the challenges in the data and things like that. The third is uh, self like uh, annotation teams, in-house annotation teams, when you, when the company grows uh, annotation team in, in, in itself. And uh, another option is to uh, rent services, like there are annotation companies whom you can pay. Uh, so professional services, I'm writing down this in the chat so you will have all five options. And the fifth one is random people on Amazon Mechanical Turk or uh, Yandex Toloka. I think some of you may have heard about it or have used. So my general question is, who is annotating in the project that you have been involved and what are the challenges with all this? Like, does Amazon Mechanical Turk work? Uh, is it hard to find in, uh, experts? Do your engineers ever annotate? This is the first thing. And the second thing, what tools do you use? Do you use your own tools? You develop your own tools or you use some existing tools uh, or, or maybe you use Super Annotate and maybe Super Annotate can, Bahan from Super Annotate can tell what other tools there are that people use. So I think these questions will be interesting to our audience. Uh, let's start from you, Manvel. Thank you. So when you started talking about uh, engineers annotating records, I remember the story when we were doing a very complex machine learning model and like we spent two or three engineering months to develop models. And one day I, when I started working on that task, I, I looked at data set and saw, uh, saw that it's very minimal in size, like 1,200 uh, 12, 12, items. And I decided to just ask like how many, how much money we spent for that data because it was like, we spent a lot of time analyzing the, the data and it was very expensive. So when I asked, they told me that they spent, that, that they spent like $6 to collect that data set. So we spent this huge engineering time to work with like this minuscule data set and if we spend like $100 more, we can get huge data set and we don't need very complex models. So, th th so that's the thing, like sometimes we as, uh, as uh, researchers, as data scientists, we think that it's like data science that gets, gets good, get, that builds good models, but sometimes we just need more data. Regarding experts, uh, yes, obviously we can, we as somebody who is, who are working on AI in healthcare, we only work with doctors. In many cases, we, uh, we work with doctors from, uh, who are specializing on, on some topics because, um, different, different clinics, uh, even in one city, even neighboring ones can have different schools and they can, uh, 
they can view one condition differently. So that is very, very important for us. Uh, um, should I talk about tools or or let other other guests speak? Uh, no, no, please go ahead. Uh, what about tools? Yeah. So uh, currently we are using either open source tools or commercial software to do uh, annotation. Sometimes we are using uh, medical uh, devices because mo many of them allow to uh, annotate stuff. But we see that this doesn't doesn't scale well, and we are actually thinking about adapting one of existing tools inside our company to to use it to use it for this the task. And what about privacy concerns? Like, can you annotate this on cloud or uh, especially with medical? Yeah. So uh, uh, as soon as all the uh, private information is removed, you can basically do that in cloud as well. But we are super paranoid about all this, and we try to limit as much as possible so data wouldn't leak anywhere. I see. Thank you, Levan. What about your experience? So your company is providing services to many other companies, and you work on very diverse projects so i can imagine what kind of zoo you have of different annotation strategies and uh, and annotation tools so can you please elaborate yes i was writing down here and try to recall all the projects and annotation services um first of all um i would I couldn't find here in list a client pro client provided data and data is provided from clients and um, <clears throat> in most cases we don't know who annotated them we can guess that <laughs> they were not experts or data is not clean or etc but mostly in many cases not mostly we have cl client provided engineers yes we do because also, we have enough cases when clients don't have the, any data and they don't have a, an idea that they <laughs> will need data and they think that with similar as previous speaker, like with uh, several hundred data, they can get along easily. So we involve engineers, we do annotation process by ourselves. We use label box and VCA, we cut. Uh, this is the open source annotation tool. Um, but we have different techniques, <clears throat> mostly in computer vision. And in many cases, cli client need, for instance, obje object detection or semantic segmentation. And client needs to detect, for instance, persons, cars, and maybe bottles. We can take pre-trained big models like Mascar CNN or something, or UNET or other models, run because they have, they are trained on COCOR, VOC, Pascal Voc dataset, and they can detect persons and cars easily and annotate bottles by ourselves. So, how should I say, annotate and dist annotation distillation or something like this, or an annotation, semi automatic annotation. We don't have in-house annotation team, but in I.O. they have monitoring students. Uh, these are part-time employees who are students uh, and they and also professional experts who are involved uh, in role uh, uh, yes, time after time. And they annotate in-house and they also use uh, automatic annotation, for instance, for texts with previous uh, Ad blocked ads by ad blocker. We can use. Uh, do you hear me? We hear you, but your image does not move. So maybe something oh. is there, but we hear you. Okay, good. good. Uh, I can recall only one case when we applied. Oops. Zoom decided to disconnect Levan, obviously. We have seen all problems with Zoom today. 
Uh, let's see what we can do. Before he gets back, maybe. Uh huh. Okay, you are back. Yeah, uh, I did don't know. Yeah. Sorry, I was dropped out. Yeah. <laughs> Drop out. <laughs> so I can recall only one case when we apply for professional services. <clears throat> Actually, our, one of the, our clients applied for professional services. It was his money and under our supervision, we use label box service for annotation. And if we have other option, yeah. Professional services, uh, no, we don't, I don't know, maybe, uh, yes, clients give, clients apply for professional, not we, not we about Amazon Maker, no, yes, label box, label box it is. This is our experience of annotations. That's all I guess. I, I, I think I call, call almost. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Vahan, so you are on the other side of the business. You basically uh, sell your tools so that others can can do. And I think for many of your clients, your tools are enough. So maybe you can share your experience about the more exotic cases where someone required you to uh, required some very complicated tool that it was not possible to develop only for one client. And also one more thing I would really love you to comment is about the usage of cloud-based systems. So how often do you encounter cases when the client says that I cannot give my data to cloud come and install it on my own computer. Yeah, so I will start with the second question. First of all, thanks for invitation. Uh, my pleasure to be here and then kind of share with some experience. Overall, uh, data privacy is coming like, uh, is becoming like a big issue with some, uh, with a lot of companies. And then we see an increasing demand, especially in the medical field. And then uh, that uh, people are very, very, like super paranoid about like sharing their data. If you're thinking about autonomous driving perspective, they don't really care about the data uh, privacy, especially in US. But then if you're looking at Volkswagen or some other companies, then, then again, they have like huge GDPR issues. In my opinion, that's one of the reasons that they're far behind Tesla when they're uh, developing their uh, autonomous systems. And then you have all these other applications in retail, like manufacturing. So those guys are also uh, highly uh, kind of caring about their data privacy. But then uh, once you're providing that uh, good enough uh, privacy solutions, because anyways, their data in, is in one of the cloud systems. And uh, sometimes they're like uh, thinking that, okay, if this is gonna increase my uh, data gathering and annotation, uh, kind of cycle 10x, then I'm willing to do this sacrifice uh, because as uh, one of, uh, I think as, as Livan was mentioning, this semi-automatic annotation is becoming like a thing to do. And then if you are really confident in a certain class, then you can put like a, a neural network training and then do some predictions on certain classes and then only annotate some other classes uh, that are not really being done. If I would answer you uh, your first question, as you were saying, I'm on, on the other side, I've seen all these five different use cases. Probably the first two are uh, the most interesting for us because we're kind of building tools for CV engineers and uh, uh, experts that, uh, or uh, experts that will do annotations faster. So we're concentrating on speed. But then of course, uh, as we started with providing a service in Armenia, then our tools also fit very well for in-house annotation teams and uh, other professional services. And at the moment we're working with more than 20 different annotation service companies to uh, kind of uh, educate them our platform and then tell them to do their projects in our platform. The mechanical Turk option, in my opinion, is not going to be used that much and uh, we're not really concentrating and this is the area that we're really far away. We think that the annotation task is going to become like uh, a skilled job in the future 
and then uh, if you want to, with certain tasks, it's, it might work, but then majority of the tasks in computer vision are becoming tougher and tougher to annotate. And then we think that uh, you need highly uh, specialized skills to learn those tools in, in order to perform the annotations. I mean, people uh, left uh, annotating cats and dogs, right? So it, it was a while ago. I see. Thank you for the answers. Uh, you know, one aspect that I wanted to mention about experts on uh, engineers annotating is that even in my experience, I have seen that. Uh, so you, you give a tool to the annotators and then like in one or two months, you discover that there is a problem with your tool that you didn't really understand that this kind of data probably requires some different, some other tools that you didn't have in mind. So uh, the, the first round should al always go with engineers. <laughs> so, <laughs> or the feedback loop should be like in, in days or weeks, not in months. So uh, I made this mistake a couple of times. So <laughs> yeah. that was yeah. one. I yeah. had the same experience. And in my books. Yeah, in, in the future, some, some of the things that are going to be a lot more important is like connectivity uh, with the platform to some other services. Let's say if you're using AWS, you want like a very well-written SDK that can connect uh, your stream and then integrate your pipeline to the tool uh, as well as uh, kind of have very good solutions of doing an exploration of your data set. Because once you have uh, your 10,000 or 100,000 images, the more important thing is becoming how you find mistakes easily in your images. So like very good filtering uh, mechanisms and those type of stuff, like find a mistake, propagate it in other images, like create an issue, those type of things are becoming like uh, very, very essential. Yeah, I think that becomes even more important for the companies who have constant flow of new data. Like, uh, for example, Tesla is always t telling about this, that they, uh, there was a lecture by Andre Karpati a couple of months ago when someone from the audience said that yesterday I drove my car and passed uh, next to a stop sign. And Andre said, thank you, we got this thing. <laughs> So uh, it, when, when you have a constant flow of your of data, you uh, really want to have some of it in your annotation tool. And then if this data stream is large, you want to be, you, you don't want every image to happen uh, to appear in your annotation tool. You want to move there the hardest ones or the new ones, sort of anomalous uh, ones. Yeah, and then it becomes connected to uh, very exciting fields of machine learning, which is like out of distribution detection. And uh, I'm, I don't think these things have been productionized yet, but probably uh, at least in Tesla, maybe they have, or in s several uh, this uh, type of companies, but probably they are going to happen in the future to become available to everyone so that you always are able to find the most difficult cases and give it to annotators. Yeah, I actually wanted to comment on that as I've seen using that, uh, I mean, active learning to uh, choose those, those cases that are harder for the model. And with my, one of my students, we, we did an experiment uh, which showed that we can drastically reduce uh, a number of items that we need to annotate using, using active learning like 10 times. So th that is very important thing that we all should work on. That's pretty interesting because uh, if I can elaborate there, so uh, when you do when you do active learning, but you already have a good validation set, then probably it's easy to find the best strategy. But when you don't have the final set and you are in real life scenario where you have small amount of data and you have to choose the next one sometimes these theoretical results do not transfer well, right? Because... Yeah, so the, the scientific research that we tried to do uh, wasn't not that scientific because actually the simplest uh, heuristics actually work there. 
So what we did, we just chose uh, items. So we basically took uh, like from 10 or 100 items, we chose the ones that the model is least sure about and, and fed that with, to, uh, to annotators. And actually, we simulated all that, but actually it worked. And another th thing that we did, we even worked with uh, errors in validation set. So let's say that we, there are some number of items that are already uh, classified, annotated, and we used the same very simple strategy to figure out which items are annotated incorrectly. So that worked pretty well in those experiments that we did. So. That's very important and cheap. Very good to know. Yeah. Maybe I can add something yes. here. Uh, we're heavily like doing research in active learning as well. So when you're looking at classification standpoints, things are working nice. There are a lot of papers. Like it's beautiful. But once you start like moving on into like normal, like even object detection in active learning is not really working that well. I'm not really talking about semantic segmentation. We're doing a lot of contour detection. Those are the fields that active learning are not really showing that uh, great of a result, to be honest. Completely agree. And one of my students is going to do active learning on object detection. So we will talk soon to you probably about that. Okay, so <laughs> let me go to the next uh, topic. So. Uh, we all hear about various companies advertising their cloud vision APIs. So you have a data set, they claim the following. Like I had a conversation with a product manager at AWS recognition team. He said, you know, everything AWS does uh, like in its life, the, the goal of AWS is to leave only the hardest tasks to, to people, to, like, to leave only the business logic to the engineers or the product teams. Uh, the rest of it, like uh, we start from uh, creating computers in the cloud, creating servers, creating databases and so on. But now we want to add more and more things in AWS so that engineers do not waste their time on training models. So we, our goal is to provide you an API where you just put your annotated data and that's it. You, you get a final model and it works. So my question is to all of you, uh, do you, th uh, have you ever seen this really work? Like, do you know a case when a company could use these APIs and get a reasonable result without having an ML engineer in the team? And uh, what do you feel how it will be in the next like five to 10 years? Will this become easier or, or we will always need uh, ML engineers in the team? Uh, Marvel, let's start from you. Thank you for the question. I actually seen a case where somebody who is not uh, an engineer or have very limited knowledge in um, programming at all, and he used an online service where he implemented a pretty good model. Uh, needless to say, it was a pretty uh, easy task, but that was very, very, uh, very like surprising to me that somebody without any knowledge of like programming, computer science, can can build reasonable models for simple tasks. And uh, so we are working in uh, in a in a, in time where deep learning models are getting cheaper and cheaper, and uh, the demo uh, we are look seeing democratization of deep learning and. A uh, hard task would be, would be would be cheaper and cheaper, and yeah, I think that some online online tools, uh, offline tools. In many cases, we, will, we would see something like Excel for machine learning, Excel for deep learning, for to some for somebody who doesn't have that many skills, and and that revolution who replaced like com complex, uh, let's say. Uh, 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 translation services to, uh, and like people used to build translation uh, services for like 10, 20, 30 years. And then one day deep learning came and people replaced it with one year of work. So we will see that trend continuing. So I'm happy to see like all that happen. Levan, what are your thoughts about this? 
Um, I would say that yes, I agree uh, with Manuel in many aspects. We also apply for cloud services often, especially for OCR services, for multilingual OCR services. Uh, yes, sometimes, yeah, um, sometimes uh, tasks are complicated. Maybe uh, we need more customization, I would say, or complex tasks, complex ta custom tasks, which will stay, I believe, on our side. So we will not lose jobs in the near future. <laughs> and uh, uh, I saw also companies, API-based companies, which only used client, which only <laughs> developed client side, and um, they used AI services end to end. But uh, I saw companies, uh, and I know these companies because they asked for help and they <laughs> asked <laughs> for <laughs> custom models. So on this stage, I think uh, maybe we will see. Mm, machine learning models even in Excel or in Word and we already see some of them I believe but still uh, still I think uh, th there is many things to do and other thing is uh, there are many already established models which you can take out of the shelf and just use it in your application and don't spend extra money on cloud services. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. So uh, if I could summarize what Levan said from a startup perspective. So if you're starting a new company and you don't yet have a large team or funding, you can probably start to do a lot uh, with a cloud-based API and get to your MVP and then go and <laughs> start raising money for uh, for more complicated models and then maybe ask Max in AI to develop the more complicated one for you. Okay, so uh, exactly. Van, what about your experience? So you are working with many clients and ha have you seen any clients to take the annotations from your platform and put it into Amazon or Google Cloud Vision API and be happy with it? Uh, yeah, usually I guess uh, this is what's happening, right? Um, most of the clients that we have, they're not really uh, training on their own computers. They're use, usually using some other uh, uh, platforms uh, for training. What you were saying for very simple tasks, and I'm very in line with uh, our other two speakers. Uh, for simple annotation tasks, I think it's it's pretty much an Excel uh, task. So if you're doing object detection and then you think that uh, faster RCNN or detector on two is going to be enough for you then those stuff uh, actually in our platform, our annotators are uh, training models and then they're doing some predictions. And uh, so that part is like, we're doing five different tasks, like semantic segmentation, panoptic segmentation, like emotional recognition, bounding boxes and, uh, and instance segmentation as well. But once you're going to more uh, kind of unique tasks, when well, let's say if you're in autonomous driving, then, then you're, dealing with lanes or cuboids, then this is we did, didn't really put enough attention. And I don't think in AWS there is no any training that is uh, doing cuboids, uh, like drag and drop types. But then with the time, I think it will be a standard. And I'm totally, uh, I totally agree with uh, Harant in this case. Uh, Excel is going to be a new, thing, <laughs> a new thing. And I've seen a couple of YC startups at the moment that are trying to do that. Uh, the problem there is if you're trying to solve the problem at the end and you don't really address the beginning pain, then it's, it's really hard to find the clients that already have that last pain. So, uh, What do you mean with beginning and end? Uh, you mean the annotations? Yeah, so you usually start with the annotations and then you continue. Uh, like if you're, if you're done with the annotation, yeah, you can go and then explore your algorithm. But then it's usually in the loop. So this annotation is tightly connected with improving your data. And uh, this is, I think if you're solving that end problem, then this beginning, beginning is uh, gonna be even a tougher problem to kind of uh, uh, solve because you want good uh, 
connectivity and integrations with other uh, tools. And it doesn't really have to be one tool. You, you can do like multiple other tools. So I'm sorry, did I get it right? So in your tool, you also have this faster RCNN feedback loop to pre-annotate for you if, if you have some annotations. Did I Correct. Yeah. Correct. So it's, it's a couple of clicks basically. And then our annotators are really experienced now doing those uh, uh, trainings in the cloud. And uh, you don't have the problem of like choosing correct hyperparameters, tuning it. You have some default stuff that works in most cases. That's what is confusing to me. So we do have a default hyperparameters and then we have uh, new uh, kind of places that you can change the hyperparameters. So in the text mm. too, you have eight or 10 hyperparameters and then you kind of twitch it a little bit, but then we tell our annotators don't really deal with this. Just try the vanilla options and then uh, probably it's gonna work. And uh, it works often, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, after one day of annotations, usually you see some improvement, especially with boxes, it's, it's, it's pretty nice. I see. Okay. Sounds cool. Uh, we worked on, on a similar project where we had to deal with very limited annotations and our initial observation, so it's not anything final, I can't uh, give you a conclusion, but the initial feeling is that when we had very few annotations and then we started from 10, for example, and moved to 100, you need some learning rate change between this 10 and 100. So after 100, it's almost the same, like the same learning rate, same hyperparameter can work, but in this extremely low regime, it's <laughs> you need to be more careful. Yeah. Yeah, in, in our case, uh, you can, uh, each epoch is saved and then you can rerun starting from wherever you stop. So if you did like three different versions, basically, then you can start from the second version and then continue from there with a different hyperparameter. In case overfitting or whatever, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, great. Uh, and one more thing that I would like to ask you, although we are out of time, but I think everyone enjoys this conversation. Uh, what about bringing the models to production? So you train a model, you get the data, you train the model, you are relatively happy with the results, but uh, you have different constraints to put it in real-time production, right? So I used to work in a company where the uh, the, uh, the other parts of the pipeline were so long that we didn't care about the machine learning part. And so if, if the machine learning component, if the application of the deep learning network took, for example, two minutes, no one cared. Uh, except that uh, at some point the CEO came and said that, you know, did you see uh, how much money we paid to AWS? You have to optimize your neural networks. <laughs> but uh, in other scenarios, for example, if your model is going to run in, in a drone, you want it to run on Raspberry Pi CPU and <laughs> very quickly so that you don't lose your battery or <laughs> during the flight. So uh, I would like to you, all of you, to share your experience in the projects that you have worked on, what kind of steps you did to make these models applicable in real life? Starting from doing nothing, just putting it there, uh, and continue to do many things. We had some, several talks about this today, but I think there are many more things that you could recall from your experience that we didn't hear. Marvel, please go ahead. Thank you. So uh, actually, uh, I, I, I've did a lot of things, but there is a famous talk by Baidu Research where they tell about how they managed to run WaveNet model, which is a very deep, uh, very uh, computingly expensive model, autoregressive model using C on CPU, uh, getting like 1000 times uh, improvement in speed. So the main idea that they tried there, first they we wrote everything in C++. Second, they used a uh, fixed point arithmetic. Uh, third, they, uh, they did a multi-threading. And uh, fourth, they re-implemented re part of the code in assembly. And that is the like 
ultimate thing. That, so it is a very interesting uh, talk. You can find slides online and they s tell about every step and ev every step is in some engineering ingenuity and it's like a beauty of engineering. I, I, um, I think that everybody should watch it and look at it. It's very interesting. Uh, usually what we are interested in is uh, decreasing memory usage. Uh, in that case, like just disabling calculations of uh, gradients already helps a lot. Uh, second thing is to uh, reduce uh, reduce uh, latency. In that case, sometimes we just, uh, so a medical image is like 800 slices of, uh, of uh, 512 by 512 images. So instead of calculating the model for all the, all the layers, we can uh, apply model for, to, for every 10th layer and then do an interpolation. That is another thing that we do. And uh, actually that's it. I think that in many, uh, many situations you just don't need that, that big of an improvement. Thank you. Uh, Levan, what is your experience? Oh, I have hard experience and <laughs> in um, most of the cases uh, when model run and do background jobs, just disabling gradient calculation by touch works <laughs> exactly as we, uh, it has enough uh, performance gain and we can just afford. Uh, in Several cases, if uh, operations are supported, we use transfer to the static graphs, tort script. Uh, it, I would say, gives performance gain, but not significantly big, unless you are uh, loading model in C++. I think I have only a couple of uh, Experience. Not, I did not do it myself, I'm not a C++ guy, but our engineers, they suffer uh, with CAFE 2 uh, when we translate this on ONNX and then CAFE 2 and second was TorchScript and TorchLib library and TorchLib uh, came easier, translation was easier, but uh, yeah, it has it had performance. I don't know exact numbers and how big relief I had. Uh, we use quantization often. Uh, dynamic quantization as well as static quantization if um, client is not uh, nasty <laughs> and client that doesn't need uh, accuracy, exact accuracy. So we can use static quantization, don't bother ourselves. Uh, that's all I have, I would say. Uh, yes, and sometimes we yeah, change with lighter models. I only, once we tried to use knowledge distillation, but it, it was classification, it was easy task, but still we left a bigger model because client, client was not satisfied. He, he was you always could find outliers and send you back and complain. So that's all. <laughs> that's all that I get. Thank you. Not much experience by, my, by myself. Uh, thank you, Levan. And uh, Vahan, I think you can answer this in from two aspects because you also develop for your own needs. You have models for your own needs in, in your tool. Uh, we have heard today a great presentation by Eric about edge detection, edge segmentation, semantic, and uh, you also know what uh, probably your clients do with the data that they get from your platform, so please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to be honest, I'm not as informed like on the, the algorithmic side as we're doing like, like pure deep learning research type of uh, as, aspect. So we're doing channel cloning and knowledge distillation, right? Those uh, teacher student models and so on. Uh, on the other side, we're not really kind of digging and then knocking the doors of the client and then asking, what are you guys doing? Or what? Maybe it's something that we can improve on our end to have more, but then this is uh, something that we, 
think that uh, some clients, they're very sensitive to like opening up. If they're using some Segnet or some type of uh, mask or CNN, they're fine. But as, as far as it goes more to into specific, it, it feels that uh, they're having some IP issues like uh, telling about uh, some of the things that they're doing. And your an annotation service, uh, I'm sorry, Levan, uh, your annotation service runs on CPUs. Uh, do I get it right or? Uh, the, the service, you mean? Um, like annotate.online if you go there and. Oh yeah, uh, it, it's a mix, right? So it's running in AWS. So if you want to run and do some predictions, then we have a GPU and then most of the stuff is uh, running on CPUs. We recently put the edge detection on, on a CPU, but then now we're going to do like specialized autonomous driving use case where we will just put a bigger model and then try to charge for that. So, because it's going to reduce even like another two times faster, the entire semantic scene annotation. So if you're spending 15 minutes instead of 30 minutes, that's, you should be ready to pay 10 cents for that, right? So. I see. Okay. <laughs> Levan, you were saying something? Yeah, I, I would like to add that I had the cases when operation were not supported by TorScript and uh, I, we had complicated model and translated part of the parts of the model in TorScript. But after all, we had performance gain, like, you know, 0, 0.0 something, 0 0.2 or <laughs> something. That's all I would like to add. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's it for today. Uh, I, I hope this was useful. This was really useful for me and I hope the other participants enjoyed it as well. Thank you very much for your time and for accepting our invitation. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that's the end for today. Yes, please, uh, final words if you have. Yeah, thank you, Ranjan, for organizing this. I think you guys are a great job. I'm very happy that things like that uh, are happening uh, in the country. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us. And I, we will be glad to, to see something like, or like this happen regularly. And many kudos to you for organizing this. It's awesome. I would also like to say thank you. I'm really glad. And thank you for having me on this conference. And uh, I would say, yes, it, if it will be regular, I would be happy to attend or maybe be a speaker next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So this was made possible by our sponsors, WebFontaine, Simply Technologies, Crisp and PixArt. And this is the end of the first day. Here is a quick overview uh, for tomorrow. So we will start again at 10 a.m. with uh, two presentations about audio, and then we'll move to more NLP-ish stuff, and we will have uh, a panel discussion at 4 p.m. here at one time, just like today. Thank you very much for attending, and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.